Donald Trump and the House of Representatives have rushed through a bill to take away your health care. And now they're celebrating? But it's a fake victory once people realize what they're losing. That and photographer Corky Lee on Chinese exclusion and the Golden Spike on Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. That's next on Emil Amux Takeout. Hi, everyone, and welcome to what I call a meal amongst takeout. We serve it, you take it out. Conveniently forms the acronym EAT, and it is time to eat. My takes on all things about race, society, politics, and diversity, and everything those things touch in our culture and society with respect to Asian Americans. But, of course, you don't have to be Asian American to lend us your ears. We give them back, and it's your minds we want. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host. And you might ask, well, what's this amok business, Emil? Uh, don't I read that in the DSM-5? It's like some kind of malady or something? Well, the short story is, for nearly 15 years, my Emil Lamont column was a staple of Asian Week, what was once the leading Asian-American weekly in English in America. Amok was the name of my compilation of essays, and Amok is on my driver's license, not indicative of my mental state. And now the column is home-based on the website of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, the blog at aaldef.org slash blog. Check it out, and if you like what you see and hear, ALDEF is a 501c3. Uh, go to the donate button. It's tax-deductible. By the way, you can maybe save the dates in the future, June 23rd, June 28th, next month. The 23rd through 28th, I'll be at the San Diego Fringe Festival with my one-man show, The Amok Monologues. Hey, yeah, The Amok Monologues. Uh, Harvard NPR Death on Mission Street, the subtitle. Check it out. Go to my personal site at www.amok.com, and we'll have info up later in May. On this episode, we talk to Asian-American photographer, activist Corky Lee. And what makes him click that shutter? And his personal pilgrimage to make that famous Golden Spike photo of the railroads connecting. You remember that photo. You've seen it in history books. So did Corky. And he wanted that picture to be inclusive and have Chinese depicted. Because if you know your history, well, you know the Chinese more than helped build the railroad. Corky Lee, his story, his photograph. On this podcast. But first, we've got so much news on this week, the first week of Asian Pacific American uh, Heritage Month. Well, it was initially called Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, and now I think people are, are trending toward Asian American Pacific Islander. And then, of course, there are the people who say Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. But that spells out and P, which, I don't know, is that a good acronym? Okay, we got a lot. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a bit. But so much news. The Republicans, of course, needed 216 votes. They got 217. Just enough to pass a first step in the repeal of Obamacare. But does anyone doubt that they rushed it? I mean, there were no real major hearings. They were just going for the win and they don't even know how it's going to work exactly. Frankly, this is as close to an executive action or executive order as it gets, because Trump met with the legislators, met with the House. And so if you sort of compare it to the travel ban, it's a mess like everything else Trump does, poorly thought out. And I'm sure it will surprise people, even the GOP, once it's done. I mean, when I say done, I mean, like, once it's gone through at least the, the Senate's uh, uh, perspective and, and their uh, fine-tooth comb. Look, this wasn't done for your health. It was done for Trump and the GOP's political health. 
They needed a legislative prescription because the first 100 days has been dismal. Can, can, I think that's fair. And now they have something. It's not much. It's temporary. It's a fake victory. Uh, they didn't do a complete budget analysis. But once they do and they see it will lop more people off of health insurance, more than the 20 million that Obamacare added, well, there will be no cheering. Costs will rise, insurers will win, people will lose. So, you want a better answer? You need a health care plan with bigger pools to spread the risks. I mean, that's how insurance works. You go to these state pools, and they're just not big enough to cover all the risks that are within that state. You cater to the people and not to the insurers. And we'll have a better plan. That means bigger pools, more people, spread the risk, lower costs. But if the GOP continues to cater to insurers and the quote-unquote free market, millions of people will suffer. So you call this a victory? Here's, you know, Trump at the Rose Garden press uh, press announcement or celebration announcement says premiums are coming down, deductibles are coming down. I don't think Trump knows what he's saying. Let's see when the CBO comes out with its analysis. But I think there's only one answer. And it's the answer that even Obamacare was short of. And that's called a Medicare system for all ages, not just for seniors. But the GOP just can't see that. Too much government, too much caring, too much humanism for Trump's style of government. Remember that AP interview he did, uh, you know, one of his 100-day interviews, and he talked about, hey, government, you know, in business, we don't have heart. Government, they they try to have too much heart. We don't, can't afford heart in government. So I ask you, where are those Syrian baby photographs now? You know, you ought to flood the White House with pictures of your dear relatives or yourselves who are endangered because of the Trump care or the Trump not care plan. Make him see them. He learns from pictures. He learns from your words. Remember those Syrian babies. He's got to remember the American people who will be hurt by his simple action, this so-called victory of the Trump care plan. First step, but it does not it does not herald something positive for the American people. So it is painful to see the GOP and and Trump celebrate. It's a fake victory for the man who disdains fake news unless he can brand it himself. Uh, They'll know it's a fake victory once people realize what they're losing. Now, speaking of fake news, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte went after the New York Times uh, this past week, which editorialized that he should be investigated by the International Criminal Court for Mass Murder after allegations were uh, levied against Duterte that the war on drugs in the Philippines had led to 8,000 deaths. Of course, the Philippines only claims to about uh, 2,800 deaths, but the claim is now 8,000 At the International Criminal Court, Rodrigo Duterte was not pleased by the editorial, and he went uh, before the the media in the Philippines, and he called the New York Times a-holes. That rhymes with uh, bass hole. And he's not fishing. After which, President Trump reached out immediately because... One man who likes fake news, you know, will definitely embrace another. And, of course, Trump needs a little help with North Korea. And there's the Philippines, an ally in an ally in Asia, you know, that is, you know, strategically off target, not really there like Japan or South Korea, maybe a perfect ally so that the United States can do what it plans to do, and it's perfect setup for Trump to embrace Duterte. But of course, people see this and say, wait a minute. 
Much talk about that U.S. embrace of Duterte. But I say this. Remember Reagan and Bush loved the dictator Ferdinand Marcos. And that was the beginning of some real attention the Philippines got here in the United States. I don't think we've had the same kind of thing. Even with the the victory of People's Power and Cory Aquino, I think the Philippines was really off the map. So in some ways, it's kind of good that Duterte is doing what he's doing because people are noticing. And besides, Duterte is not a dictator yet. I mean, not like Marcos, who was a full-fledged dictator, fully enabled by Reagan and Bush. But look, here's the thing. Duterte and Trump are kind of similar in a lot of ways. I think unwittingly, they're starring their own global reality show. So you think he can lead? At this point, I'd have to say Duterte may be slightly more successful. He's got about nine months, nine, ten months under his belt versus Trump's 100 days. But even if you take that big number of 8,000 deaths of Filipinos in that drug war, I don't know. Trump, with his Trump care, takes care of more than 20 million just like that. I would say Duterte is doing slightly better. Well, here's something that's real. Asian American Pacific Island Islander Heritage Month, AAPI Heritage Month. And, you know, I was uh, working with Congressman, then Congressman Mineta, back when they were moving. It initially was a week and now it's a full fledged month. And we were wondering, what should we call this? And I always thought Asian Pacific American would be the prescribed phrase for this big tent, big umbrella style of Asian American politics. But apparently that's not inclusive enough for the Native Hawaiians or the Pacific Islanders. So it's officially Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, but people are calling it Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And that's another podcast. Now, I tweeted if uh, Donald Trump would tweet about it, and he did. He, he did. I, I tweeted on May 1st, or actually May 2nd, if we'd see a tweet. But, uh, in fact, something came out on May 1st by uh, the Donald, and he linked it to his proclamation, a PR release written by probably the one Republican Asian American on staff there, that mentioned Dr. Sammy Lee, the great Olympic diver, the first Asian American man to win an Olympic gold uh, medal. And that was in the 1948 Olympics. And it mentioned Catherine uh, Su Fun Chung also embodied the spirit of the month back in 1932. She was the first Chinese American woman to earn a pilot license at a time when only 1% of all pilots in the U.S. were women. Trump, of course, likes any one percenter. Trump's proclamation was fairly boilerplate, as you'd expect from a man who thinks diversity is identity politics, a negative, and not a hallmark of a nation that believes in equality. But Trump does cite Public Law 102-450, which makes May each year Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. I mean, he's not going to try to repeal it like, say, Obamacare. Here was Trump's quote. I encourage all Americans to learn more about Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander heritage and to observe this month with appropriate programs and activities. Like maybe one that will let him know that millions of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders will be losing health care under his Trump no care. So we'll have to see if he takes his own advice. You know, we can start with this historic picture of the railroads and the Golden Spike. You've seen it, right? I've, I've got it posted at the uh, on the ALDEF blog at aaldef.org slash blog. You know that picture where the, the people are standing like a, a, a panoramic senior high graduation picture? It's the railroads coming together, the country coming together. It's unity. 
and the Chinese built the railroad, except there's no Chinese in the picture. Now, photographer Quirky Lee saw that when he was a kid growing up in New York, and it was the first mention of any Chinese people that he saw in his history books. The text said Chinese people helped build the railroad, but he didn't see any Chinese there. Now, I talked to Corky. He said he he bought a magnifying glass, the best one he could find at Woolworths, and he still couldn't see any Chinese. His conclusion that Asians were excluded again. So, you know, May is quite a month. On May 6th, we celebrate the 135th anniversary of Chinese Exclusion Act, which was signed into law on that day by President Chester A. Arthur in 1882. Boy, Chester A. Arthur, he was one of the worst presidents we've ever had. And and so, of course, the Chinese, the recognition of the Chinese Exclusion Act and all the horrible things it did, it's important to recognize that historic moment. But May 10th is the 148th anniversary of the photographic exclusion that has been bothering Corky Lee since he first saw that picture of the Golden Spike at Promontory Point in uh, Utah. On May 10th, Corky will stage a flash mob photo hoping for people in period dress to do what people have done for years, which is show up there and honor that May 10th date. Only for the last few years, Corky has been doing this with a picture with actual Chinese people, the people who built the railroads. He's doing it again this year. It's a tradition he's building up for the uh, up to the grand 150th anniversary shot, which is coming up in a couple years. So this one is the 148th on May 10th. And there's always usually something special he does. Like one year, it was the Buddhist ceremony at the nearby Chinese Arch, which was believed to be the first one ever. So go ahead, make a pilgrimage to Utah for AAPI Heritage Month. If you're looking for a road trip, that would be a fun one. I doubt if the Donald will be there. You can find out more by going to Corky Lee's Facebook page, Corky Lee. Listen to the podcast now on how Corky developed his sense of photographic justice and how the activist heart merged with the photographer's eye to to produce some of the most memorable photographs of modern Asian American life ever taken. Corky talks about his first camera and how his father sort of taught him, if you can use that term in the broadest possible way. Several times throughout the podcast, he talks about that picture of the Golden Spike that has been the driving force to include Asian Americans in everything he sees through the lens. And now, here's my interview with photographer, activist, and my friend, Corky Lee. I, let's just begin by saying, by asking, what does Corky Lee want to see and experience behind the lens? And what is it that makes Corky Lee click the shutter? Well, I said uh, previously that if uh, a published uh, volume of my uh, photographs are, uh, are deposited in a library somewhere, you know, 50 years from now, the important thing is that uh, people will, will see what life was like, and um, yeah, in my time period, and uh, I, I think that there's a growing number of uh, students, you know, younger people. You know, I'm considered an OG, older generation. People coming up to me and and said that they studied my photography. That they actually used the word "study" my photography mm. while they were in college. So I'm kind of amused because, you know, I can't think of any um, college professor having a course on Corky Lee photography. Mm-hmm. But then they, they say that they've seen my photographs in uh, Asian American uh, history books or, or studies and so forth. So, but they, they can't recall what photograph resonated with them. They just, you know, I, I think they 
uh, resonate with the, the name Corky Lee because, you know, how many Corky Lees are out there? True. So, so but what so is I, it? I think it's, yeah, so uh, I think it's more more so the name and then that they there's a vague uh, uh, recall of uh, any number of photographs, but they can't pick out one particular photograph. Mm -hmm. But, all right, but what is it that when you are behind the lens and you see what's through the lens, what do you want to see and experience behind the lens that makes you click and say, that's the moment? Yeah. Well, uh, a lot of times I'm uh, looking for something that uh, somebody else yeah, probably has not uh, examined closely. Um, and uh, they should uh, take a note of that. Uh, so uh, a lot of the stuff has to do with civil rights. It can be day in the life type photographs, um, special that uh, people don't uh, hear or, or see much of. This past weekend, I, I went to a, a Thai uh, street festival for the New Year, uh, as opposed to going to a, a Japanese cherry blossom festival, because I know more people will be there. But I, I decided to go to the, the Thai uh, one, which you know, has a smaller crowd. But you know, the energy and the enthusiasm is, is just as high. Uh, for that, as for the cherry blossom festival, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go where people don't go. It, it's kind of like what is that that Star Trek? Yeah, yeah, mantra. You know, uh, uh, um, you know, I, I just go where people don't go. And then you see what people don't see, I guess, right? The corollary. Yeah, and I see what people don't see, and then I say, well, okay, this is this is interesting, or this is important. Uh, for an historic uh, record or perspective, and uh, I think that uh, that sort of clicks with a lot of uh, people on uh, on social media, mm -hmm. as well as you know uh, books, magazines, and stuff like that. So when the probably more so on social media now. So when the students come up to you and they say, "Oh yeah, Corky Lee," and they can't think of uh, a specific picture, is it a a kind of quirky Lee flavor or quirky Lee theme that they feel that they they feel something that goes beyond the image, like th because Corky thinks this is important, this must be important. Is there that that kind of thing that comes through in your photographs? You know, a, a single image uh, seems to resonate uh, a lot more than a. Uh, a 20-second uh, 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 film or video. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, and I think photography has that because you're, you're capturing a, a moment in, in time or in history and uh, you, um, I guess, you know, uh, uh, what I've been doing is um, memorializing at that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, when you mentioned video... Video, when I took my photography classes in college, I was taught, it was, I actually took a, a film, a, a video course or a film course, and the way they taught video was to give us all still cameras first, to say, you're oh. collecting images. And so we uh -huh. went, and this is, all right, this dates me now. I went, my, my photography course uh, is in Boston, and our assignment was to go to the airport and just to shoot the airport. Mm -hmm. And this is before security, before terrorism. Mm -hmm. It was really great. You could roam anywhere and get hello scenes, goodbye scenes, architectural mm -hmm. scenes, you know, graphics. It was just really, um, that was where I learned photography. Actually, I was learning, well, I was trying to learn film, but I, I learned image mm -hmm. by image. And, yeah, that made the film, made the moving, move, moving image, and now, uh, you know, there, every everyone has a camera now. We, we have more pictures. I mean, there are jokes about I've got more pictures of my kids than than I have of than my parents had of me. You know, unless you know, uh, my 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 dad did have well, those the, flash cameras, but yeah. Well, I think uh, somebody's already said that the. More uh, uh, pictures uh, from uh, mobile devices taken on a daily basis than there are in the entire uh, 
Library of Congress. Yeah, you know, photos in the Library of Congress. <laughs> so, so there's a glut of photos. Uh, how do you make sure that a photo is worth remembering? In, in uh, g- given that, well, I think that uh, my approach to photography, because I never studied photography, mm-hmm. uh, has been uh, through uh, through history, mm-hmm. and and it goes back to uh, the the time period that uh, I'm in uh, junior high school, uh, and the first time I, I come upon uh, any mention of Chinese in the um, social studies or American history. Was that they they built the railroad mm. uh, in in 1869? Uh, because uh, my, my dad, my dad, my mom, you know, they they were immigrants. Mm. Yeah, they certainly didn't know about that. Yeah. So you know, when I told them, uh, they said, "Oh well, if, you know, if, if you learned that in in, in school, it must be important." Mm-hmm. So that kind of, uh, um, I think it planted a seed. Uh, you know, somewhere in the back of my head, and it, it didn't germinate until uh, probably the last, you know, twenty, you know, thirty years or so, mm-hmm. or maybe actually even forty-five years, because I've you know, told people I've been photographing for forty-five years. Right. So, all right. So you bring up your family and seeing these photographs from history. Tell me. Well, about- there's only one. Well, actually, there's one photograph. Yeah, of uh, uh, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, I, I said that uh, uh, since I read about it, uh, it was just, you know, uh, one sentence, the Chinese built the railroad, or part of a, you know, a complex sentence that the Chinese contributed to the uh, building of the railroad. And there's one photograph which is probably uh, smaller than a, uh, well, it's probably like a large postage stamp. Yeah. So I figured, well, you know, exactly how many, since they didn't mention how many Chinese, you know, built the railroad, you know, I uh, got a magnifying glass and I looked. Yeah. And uh, I figured since the magnifying glass wasn't strong enough, maybe I needed to get uh, a more powerful magnifying glass. Because I had bought the, the first one in, uh, at, at the time, it was uh, sort of a version of Staples, which would have been Woolworths. Yeah. <clears throat> and when I... Uh, I tried to return it, but I didn't realize I needed a receipt. So, uh, <laughs> I, not having the receipt, I, I bought the, the larger one. Probably cost a, a couple of dollars more than, than the original one. And I still couldn't find any Chinese. And then I said to my uh, stuff, as I'm scratching my head, well, if they, they wrote, you know, is this a misprint? If they wrote that the Chinese bought the railroad, but I don't see it in this photograph that's to commemorate the completion of the trans the Railroad, you know, where, where, where does truth lie? Mm. So, um, I think in, you know, while I was in college, uh, I had uh, the, the first Chinese-American uh, professor. Uh, his name was Alan Lowe. And he taught American history. And uh, it was then that uh, he allowed me to do a, a term paper about the, the Chinese and the transcontinental world. Mm. So, you know, I went to the library... Um, this is way before the internet, and uh, I looked and looked and and, and still there's very little that I, I can actually find uh, in the library. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I uh, uh, wrote from uh, what I could find, what little I could find. Yeah. Um, I, I think there was a book called um, something like a Bitter Strength. It, it was about that, that time period. Uh, that somebody wrote, and they were called Crocker's Pets because Crocker is the uh, uh, railroad guy who actually hired uh, initially the Chinese to build the railroad. And the premise was that uh, he convinced people that uh, the, the Chinese built the Great Wall, which was you know common knowledge at that time. And uh, he said that you know, if they built uh, the the Great Wall, they can build a, a railroad. You know how uh, how difficult it could that be? So. The experiment uh, was carried on, and uh, eventually they worked well together, and they said, all right, we can, we can get more of them. And basically, that was pretty much my, my, my term paper. Well, wait, wait, college was, so, uh, when, when was this, or where was it? Uh, this would have been probably 1968, I guess, mm-hmm. 19, 1967, yeah, around that time. And you were where? 
Uh, I was here in uh, New York City. It was at Queens College. Yeah, because, you know, it's it really is significant because we didn't begin to see Asian American studies or even mention of Asian Americans in history fully until, you know, much later. I mean, I, I have a similar story to tell about Filipino immigration, where there were no books on uh, the Fili- how the Filipinos came to the United States, which was not necessarily through immigration, but as um, American nationals. And that was never really spelled out. I had to go deep into the stacks to, to get unpublished dissertations, you know, from, from, uh, mm-hmm. from Filipino scholars back in the, uh, the, from, from the 40s and 50s. And it was, you know, there's this vacant uh, space in history that I guess motivated you to inquire further, uh, photo- you know, in terms of photography. Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> 1968 is when uh, Betty Lee Sung, who's a professor at Melodis at um, City College in New York, published a book. And, and her uh, her oldest daughter was in uh, one of my classes. And, you know, she, she uh, uh, mentioned about her uh, mother publishing a book about Chinese in America. So uh, I think I got a hold of that. And then by, by some circumstance... Uh, she actually got to meet my father through uh, some mutual friend. Mm-hmm. And since she was a Lee, my father was a, uh, a Lee, uh, there was some connection uh, in which I, I found out <clears throat> around that time that practically all the Lees, you know, when they came to America post uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, they had one or two uh, cities that they always uh, would go to, given your uh, family name. And, and for the Lees, it was Baltimore. All right. Baltimore. So Betty Lee Sung, uh, yeah. Betty Lee Sung had a connection to Baltimore. My father had a connection to Baltimore. And, and some of the uh, uh, older generation uh, of people, you know, who wound up um, getting drafted or fighting in World War II, they all, they all have a connection to Baltimore. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think in the 50s, you know, Baltimore had this uh, uh, problem. Well, it was a uh, the Chinese you know, had the problem, but uh, they were actually kind of forced out of Baltimore. So the nearest, uh, yeah, the family association, because of the family association in Baltimore, uh, they, they moved to Washington, D.C. So somewhere between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., there's a cemetery which all the Lees who could not return uh, to China uh, because, you know, the communists had taken over after 1949. Uh, at least until, was it 1980 or 1979, I think it was, when they normalized relations. You know, they all wound up there. <clears throat> and uh, there's evidence of, uh, I have an uncle uh, who was older than my uh, father. Um, he was in Baltimore, but uh, I, I think my, my, I know my father, who was the youngest of four sons, uh, helped bring him over, and he was actually killed in uh, working in a hand laundry. In uh, in Baltimore, but my, my my father had his remains brought to uh, uh, New York City's um, Cypress Hills, where there's a lot of Chinese that are returning there. You you weren't born in Baltimore. You were born in New York, right? Yeah, I was born in New York. See, my my father came in 1929, hmm. and uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I was able to uh, uh, find out uh, where he lived in Baltimore. Because from the census, uh, he was registered as a border, basically mm-hmm. someone who, who resided on in this particular address. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to do some more research to find out what ship he came on and, and so forth. But, you know, my, my father never really talked about that. He, he would uh, mention his uh, experience from World War II when he was part of the Flying Tigers. Actually, he was a part of a Chinese-American unit that was assigned to the Flying Tigers. Uh, which originally were American uh, mercenary uh, pilots that uh, were paid, uh, I think, a thousand dollars in gold bullion at the time for downing uh, Japanese planes uh, before Pearl Harbor. Hmm. So uh, Roosevelt created this uh, 14th Army Air Corps, which you know was attached to the Flying Tigers in Kuomintang and so forth. My, 
my dad would talk about, you know, uh, planes flying over the Bremer Road and the, the hump and, and stuff like that. So yeah, he would always you know, reiterate that. He would reiterate uh, how he got his sergeant stripes. And then uh, I found out, you know, much later that not too many uh, uh, Chinese Americans got sergeant stripes. Your dad was... Uh, my dad was... Uh, before he was drafted, he was uh, trained as an arc welder. So he uh, learned how to weld aluminum. And that's uh, what he did when he was in, uh, in uh, I guess, in, in Burma. He uh, uh, volunteered to uh, weld a, uh, an aluminum engine on a plane. And the way he says it, you know, I think it's slightly embellished. Uh, um, it, it was for a secret mission. Uh, and uh, he got some other people to help him uh, weld the, the crack in the aluminum engine. Then the plane took off the following day. And that's how he got, uh, became a technical sergeant. So, so your dad came in 1928, which is, you know, about the same 1929. time. 1929. My father came, oddly enough, in 1928 from the Philippines. Your father must have been uh, a bit younger than my dad because he went into the army, right? He must have been a teenager. Uh, I think my dad said he was uh, 20, 18 or 20 years old at the time. Yeah. Uh, when he entered 1929. Uh Cause, yeah, I think he said eighteen. Yeah, I, I think he said he had uh, uh, ten dollars. He called it ten dollars or twenty dollars U.S. And uh, he saw on the ship he, he saw people gambling, and uh, someone uh, made quite a bit of money. So he tried his hand, and he lost half of uh, what uh, he had. And then he vowed never to gamble again. <laughs> where did where did he come from? What part of China? Uh, it, it was from um, a section uh, about 90 miles uh, southeast of uh, Canton, or what is called Guangzhou now, mm-hmm. um, uh, a place called uh, Toisan. Toisan, yeah. Or it's spelled, yeah, or it's spelled T-O-I-S-A-N. Yeah. A, a, lot of, a lot of Toysanese, um in California yeah. that I know. And and so you, mm-hmm. your father came from China to the West Coast or the China to, how did he end up in Baltimore? You know, he, he never really described how he wound up in Baltimore. Okay. Uh, he either, you know, landed, the, he, he did talk about Seattle. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did talk about Seattle for a uh, uh, so he may have landed in, in Seattle, and he may have uh, gone through Canada, because one of the routes he get to New York was to go through Canada, and you would wind up in, I think, uh, Quebec or Montreal, which sits uh, just north of the uh, New York state border, mm-hmm. and, and there was a way to, to come across. Uh, he could have come across uh, Niagara Falls, you know, near Buffalo, uh, because that's where... He was apprehended trying to bring uh, somebody in mm-hmm. from uh, from Canada. So you know, there's uh, uh, that, that that part is you know uh, somewhat nefarious on my on my family's part. How, how but, did you know, how did he uh, how did the family deal with the uh, you know the exclusion laws and the the or rather the unfriendly immigration climate at the time? I mean. Well, if, if you could get through, if you could get through uh, uh, illegally, fine. Uh, if you could get through legally, uh, I found out that uh, a lot of Chinese uh, listed themselves or, or formed a business or a corporation so they can come in as merchants. Now, merchants were allowed to uh, enter from China, uh, and that was the case with a lot of Chinese in the Mississippi Delta, I found out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they actually brought the whole families because uh, they were part of a merchant family. Uh, and I think they... So, someone has written about this, and, and they called uh, the uh, low main loophole uh, uh, inside the Chinese Exclusion Act. Because uh, uh, people... If you're, uh, of, uh, if you're a Christian, you can uh, come in on religious grounds. If you were... A student, you can come in for educational purposes. Uh, if you're a diplomat, you know, you had, you know, presumably diplomatic immunity. And then merchants, <clears throat> because there was a, a 
trade with uh, China and Japan, and the Americans wanted to more trade with uh, with China. Uh, there was a, a scene from a movie in which um, somebody says that they, they want to sell the oil that was in Texas or Oklahoma to the Chinese. <clears throat> because, you know, there was like a, a gazillion um, oil lamps that they could sell to the Chinese, for, you know, so you can light their lamps in China, so... Uh, but uh, as soon as the end of the American Revolution, there was a ship that left New York Harbor with, uh, I think, I had 20,000 pounds of ginseng. Mm. Uh, that was the largest item in their cargo hold. But there were other items. There were furs and stuff like that <clears throat> to trade. But uh, the, um, the, uh, the newly uh, Americanized Americans, uh, you know, former colonists, uh, uh, found out that uh, ginseng was actually used by Native Americans. So hmm. they, they thought that that was a great product. And you know, maybe somebody uh, uh, had told them that uh, ginseng is actually utilized in, in China. So your, your dad wound up in, in Baltimore, of all places, and then, mm-hmm. and then found his way to New York, and then you were born well, in... Uh, yeah, I don't know if he got to New York uh, after that. Uh, somewhere along the line, uh, he wound up in uh, Philadelphia, actually Camden, because by the time uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, you know, happens, uh, he's uh, working in uh, the Camden Navy Yard, mm-hmm. and they were building the equivalent of uh, Liberty ships. Uh, so, uh, and that's where he, he learned how to uh, become a, an arc welder. Did he? So be- it was from it was from Camden that he was drafted, and he was so he was a citizen by then. No, I don't think he was a citizen. Uh, uh, he, my dad, didn't become a naturalized citizen until 1956. Hmm. So by so, serving in the uh, war, they I, didn't promise him citizenship. You know that that's that's kind of questionable. Uh, there may have been individual cases in which, uh, if you, uh, you know, if you got drafted, uh, well, I think they assumed that since they needed, you know, uh, people for the war effort, you know, you, whether you're a citizen or not, you could uh, sign up or, or get drafted. Right. And uh, I think since he had a, uh, he probably had some sort of residence. It's like, you know, when you live somewhere uh, and you're on the rolls uh, in a given community, you get a uh, a notice to show up for jury duty, you know that that type of thing. So, so tell me, so tell me, did yeah. did the the story of your father? To what degree did it impact what what ultimately happened to you and and the choices you've made in terms of what you do in life and and the kind of photography that you do? My dad, my dad was always you know pretty harsh on on me being the oldest son. Uh, and not to say that he wasn't harsh on. I uh, three younger brothers also, but uh, I, I think because I was the oldest one, he had uh, uh, the harshest punishment was on me uh, to set an example for my younger brothers. So um, it, uh, he basically said that uh, I don't care, you know, what what you do in life, but you should always be a leader because uh, if you once you're a leader, people will always come to you, or if you, if you do well, people will come to you. You don't, you don't have to go out and publicize. And my dad was sort of a, he was somewhat of a, uh, not, uh, a civic, you know, no, not civic. Uh, he was a leader you know, in his own sense. On weekends, he would hang out at this uh, uh, laundry supply store. Uh, and, and that was, you know, kind of like what blacks are to uh, barbershops, you know. Mm-hmm. And they would talk and discuss politics and everything else while my mom would, would uh, go out and do some shopping uh, for groceries. And then uh, we were sent to um, uh, Sunday school and, uh, and Chinese classes and so forth. So he would hang out there, and, and he was probably one of the more senior people. So he would dispense advice. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, my, my dad was, uh, my grandfather was a, uh, was a carpenter in China. So, you know, he, he you know, my dad could uh, build things. He, he built a, a huge closet 
uh, out of uh, plywood that he had purchased and, and glued and, you know, put together. So he basically dispensed advice, and uh, people would uh, come uh, uh, maybe on, on a weekly basis to this uh, location in Chinatown to this, you know, laundry supply store. But, but he always wanted to stay out of uh, Chinatown politics because he never really liked uh, joining organizations. So, uh, but, you know, he, he would... Uh, people would invite him to look at a, uh, a storefront that they wanted to purchase for a business and so forth. And he would kind of give an um, engineering or architectural assessment about, you know, uh, what, uh, the pluses and minuses. Mm-hmm. So uh, I overheard this because uh, sometimes I had to stay uh, with him uh, in the store where we're eating uh, chashu balls and stuff like that. So this is the so, hang. This uh, is the hangout. The 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 Chinese barber shop. The the uh, the laundry supply yeah. store, huh? Yeah. So that, that, that was, for him, that was it. Uh, I don't, you know, people wouldn't call him up because I don't think he ever gave out his phone number. Um, but you know, if people came looking for him after he left, it was oh, don't worry, he's going to come back. You know, uh, next Sunday between so and so time. Uh, so, but I, I, you know, for my own relatives, you know, I know he uh, dispensed advice mm-hmm. on on uh, things that, that had to do with uh, uh, building structure, carpentry, and, and stuff like that. So, was he into photography in the same way? It was he in uh, a way to get into photography? Did he take pictures, or he he uh, was given a uh, a camera? I think he got maybe a, some. Uh, uh, introductory uh, lessons, mm-hmm. and but he would always photograph our family on on various occasions, you know, holidays and so forth, just like any other you know family uh, would do. Uh, so we would have to get dressed and you know, put on a tie and jacket and so forth. And uh, I call them the posy wozies <laughs> um, because because all my brothers hated to do that, but you know we know we had to do it. We had to move the furniture around. <laughs> <laughs> he would take the photograph, and really, I really hated it. And then one day, uh, he decided to give me the same camera that he was taking, uh, using. And uh, I, I think I was going on uh, a school trip or something, all right, or a picnic. Uh, so he gave me the camera and uh, wanted me to take photographs. So not knowing, you know, how he operated, you know, and he he never gave me a set of instructions that I could read. Okay. I just remember that, you know, he would keep the camera still, uh, advance the film, and he would take the shot, right? Mm. So when he developed the film, he was very disappointed because uh, the photographs were all out of focus. Uh, <laughs> these are your first photographs, and, huh? <laughs> yeah, these are my first photographs, and, and, and he he severely criticized me. <laughs> he says, didn't you, learn, didn't you learn anything from what I did? And, you know, I, I was too timid to tell him, well, you never told me what shutter speed or what aperture to use, you know, uh, because, well, when he was making things, you know, uh, he would have us watch, all right, but he would never explain anything, yeah. all right? You know, but watching him build a cabinet, you can say, all right, well, he uses these types of screws, and he puts it at a certain distance, so the hinges are, you know, there's like one on the top and there's one on the bottom, but, you know... He's not going to tell you that it should be like six inches from the bottom or six inches from the top, all right? Yeah. So you just sort of watch. But he figured you could learn by watching. But you can only learn so much by watching. So all it's, right? it's amazing, uh, then, that after that experience, you didn't become turned off to photography. After he criticized me, he says, well, this is what you should do, all right? Uh-huh. That was maybe three sentences, Okay. So with those three sentences, the next time you know uh, uh, he gave me the camera, I actually dreaded you know um, taking the camera out. I said, "Oh, I don't want to screw up, and I don't want to get another verbal you know thrashing." Uh, so uh, I basically, uh, uh, I think, did I look for instructions? No, he, uh, I don't know where he, he always hit the camera. What but I never of, knew where it was. What, what kind of camera was it? Oh, I think it was a. Uh, I I know he was given a, a Rolleiflex. Hmm. Like one of those but, box uh, cameras yeah. that you look down. Yeah, one of those box. Yeah. Uh, he uh, he had, but but he never uh, let us use it. Okay, oh. he never let us use it. 
there, there was a rangefinder camera that uh, that's the one he gave me. So that was like the secondary camera that he gave me. Uh, he didn't let you... If I should drop, yeah. If I drop the roll flex, you know, I, I probably would uh, not only uh, catch a verbal uh, abuse, I, I'd probably get a beating. He didn't let you touch the good stuff. He said, oh, "You get the rain, little yeah. rangefinder." Yeah, so I uh, used the rangefinder, yeah. and and he was, yeah. Well, when he saw the second set of photographs, yeah, they they were um, uh, they were better and uh, a little more to his liking. You know, ah, the the, yeah. uh, the the shutter speed was uh, you know a little it was faster, mm-hmm. uh, and, and so forth. Okay, uh, so uh, I figured I, I dodged a, a verbal abuse and, uh, and a possible beating if I, if I screwed up again. Um, because, you know, uh, I guess you sort of figured I, I had learned something from my first experience. Yeah. Well, the, the little so, range but, finder is, is uh, keep in mind, uh, people listening, you know, back in those days, there was no autofocus. There was no, you know, green button on the Nikon or, you know, the, you know, where... Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I found out that you have to, you know, merge the, the two images together on the range finder, and then that meant you were in focus. Yeah. Uh, and once you're in focus, you just have to figure out the shutter speed and, uh, and the opening of the lens. So. Yeah. Um, the parallax so, view uh, for for the photographers listening in. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. No. I, actually, on the roll of film mm-hmm. back then, uh, Kodak would uh, give you a suggested um, uh, aperture setting and shutter speed. Right. Okay. So after reading that, I said, oh, all right, fine, man. man, man you know, because the first time he gave me the camera, he loaded the film into the camera. Yeah. So I never saw the packaging uh, on Kodak, right? Yeah. So Kodak would always have, you know, all right, on, on a cloudy day, set it at F5.6, and your shutter speed should be uh, like 125th of a second or something like that. Yeah. So I said, oh, okay, fine. If, if that's what Kodak says, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great dull father. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, look at and, least yeah. at least you were able to get get the the you know get some shots. I've had rangefinders where I've tried to load the film and the film didn't take in the sprockets, and you oh, open yeah. up the uh-huh. back and the film is still in the can. It's it did, yeah. not, it did not take. <laughs> so at least you had something. Well, all right. So this yeah. is your first your second roll with a rangefinder. Uh, did that spark the love of photography that you you all obviously have now? Well, my, my real uh, foray into photography wasn't until I got my uh, first job uh, after I got out of college. I got hired as a community organizer, you know, the same term that Barack Obama had when, when he was uh, in Chicago. And I was organizing tenants to uh, go on rent strike to improve their uh, physical conditions, you know, if uh, uh, their mailboxes are, you know, broken or, uh, you, you get as many tenants as you possibly can, uh, they withhold their rent, they put the money into an escrow account, and over a period of time, through attrition, you uh, force the uh, landlord to make the necessary repairs. So I was taking, basically, at that time I was using slides, uh, not uh, negative film. Mm-hmm. So I would take uh, before and after uh, photographs. And uh, once again, uh, I borrowed a camera from my roommate because hmm. he had a Leica camera, Ooh. but he also had a Pentax. Hmm. Uh, but around the same time, my younger brothers, they all had cameras. I, I, I didn't have a, a camera that I owned. Uh, I, I can't understand why, but I guess maybe it's because every one of my brothers had a camera. Uh, I could always borrow theirs. Mm-hmm. Uh, so with this borrowed camera, I, I took uh, before and after a call slides of uh, the improvements that were made after uh, the uh, tenants, you know, uh, were successful uh, forcing the landlord to make the necessary repairs. Mm-hmm. So it, it was, you know, it, it was that type of stuff. And then, you know, as I, you know, bought more film, because I didn't have to process the film, you know, I would send it away to Kodak and then they would process it and uh, you keep the, the good stuff. Uh, I learned uh, how to bracket. And then, you know, there was like a needle. You try to get the needle in the middle and so forth. You know, still. So, you know, it, it was through um, basically trial and error. How about, all right, so the technical part of the photography is one thing. But how about the, the composition, I guess for composition, for before and after, it's pretty 
pretty plain, but how did you get your eye trained to see the kind of things that, you know, you capture in an event? Is, is How do you, do you look for the injustice? Do you look, how do you look for that moment that says, this is what people need to see or what they need to know? Well, I'm not so sure if uh, it's uh, what people need to see or know. It, a lot of it has to do with composition. And I, I've i learned that uh, composition is something that comes naturally to uh, to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you, you can teach composition, but you have to have a sort of a ingrained uh, or inborn uh, aptitude for composition. And, and the, the axiom, a uh, picture is worth a thousand words, but you have to get a really good picture that's worth a thousand words. Otherwise, it's, you know... The picture is uh, empty words. Mm-hmm. So you try to pack in as much information in there as possible. And either you kind of uh, go really close or you want to show the environment in which the situation is, is taking place. So it, it, and, uh, and I, I find that over the years, uh, I'm very tight with my composition. Mm-hmm. And it really doesn't uh, vary because... Uh, when I started uh, selling uh, photographs to uh, newspapers mm-hmm. as a freelance photographer, mm-hmm. that they wanted very tight photographs. They would call it, uh, you know, give me a one-column photograph or a two-column photograph or a three-column. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> and the columns were maybe about an inch and a half wide or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and then also uh, the photograph has to be uh, pretty good uh, because uh, once the in- it's the paper, especially a newspaper, the ink starts to spread. So you have to uh, take photographs that, uh, in which the negative is a little bit lighter, and then when you print it, you know, there's all these other you know, factors. There's something called dot gain right. uh, when the ink hits the paper. So things get darker yeah. or more contrasty. <clears throat> so you have to sort of look for a, a medium. And then... Um, up till like 2010, I worked for a company that printed newspapers. Mm-hmm. So I understood uh, from first-hand experience what photographs worked well and what photographs didn't work well. Uh, I would hang out with uh, the guy who would uh, copy or make half tones of, of the photographs. Uh, and then I would see the end result. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was kind of uh, watching other people but at least they would explain things to me. Uh, unlike your father. <laughs> uh, unlike my father. You know, uh, well, when I, I think when I first sold my uh, first photograph to the New York Post, and this was probably uh, be 1974, uh, I, I got to go into the dark and I watched this guy, you know, print my negative from the developed film. And uh, he, he, he didn't talk to me. Yeah. It was just, he would... Uh, put his foot on this uh, pedal that would turn on the light mm-hmm. and uh, with the use of his uh, hands and fingers he would print and dodge a photograph mm-hmm. okay and then when he felt it was finished you know he, his foot would step off and I go man you know and watching him do this and then seeing the result um, at, at the end was you know was magical yeah so this guy was creating magic in the dark room, yeah. and um, he never really talked too much about it. So I, I tried to create that when I got into the dark room, and uh, it, it took a while. Uh, I think my first exhibit was 1979, mm-hmm. when I did an exhibit on uh, a barge. Actually, it was a originally it was a garbage barge, and this woman had a. Uh, uh, sort of a houseboat mm-hmm. which uh, survived a hurricane that hit New York. So it was a big hole in the houseboat. And she managed to put the houseboat on this uh, uh, old garbage barge that, that was not in use anymore. <clears throat> so she couldn't really steer it anywhere, so it had to be towed anywhere it went. So uh, this woman, uh, after after the opening, uh, she sat me down and said, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to be a photographer uh, or do you want to be a reporter? And I said, well, you know, I think I'd like to be a, a photographer. And she said, well, okay, a lot of the photographs that you printed are too light. 
okay? Uh, you need to print them uh, darker. You have a good sense of composition, but uh, these are really not very satisfactory. So the, the exhibit was up for, I think, about a month or two months. And then uh, about six months later, for the following uh, summer, I came back and I showed her some new photographs. She said, well, no, these are a whole lot better. Uh, you're on your way to being uh, a decent photographer, she said. But she made the distinction, do you want to be a photographer or do you want to be a reporter? Meaning that, I guess, if you just had the image, you were being a reporter? Or how did you view that? I mean, if, well, you, if you had an acceptable image, maybe not the, the, the best yeah. technical image. Well, well, uh, around that time, you always, uh, every time you submit a photograph uh, to a newspaper, you had to write the caption, mm -hmm. okay? And it was, uh, I realized it was tough for me to write the caption because uh, my spelling was terrible, all right? <laughs> yeah. So I didn't want to misspell anything. <laughs> yeah. So I tried to keep it, you know, fairly uh, simple, although, you know, I, I probably had, you know, um, uh more $20 words than I had, uh, you know, 25 cent words. Uh, but yeah, you had to keep the caption to about, about 25 words or less. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because if a company in an article, every caption is you know, basically less than 25 words mm -hmm. when you look at it. Yeah. So I had to uh, keep it, you know, really pretty short enough. But then, uh, uh probably in the nineties, uh, when I was, uh, freelancing pretty, uh, regularly for uh, a weekly newspaper, Downtown Express, I start to write more than the 25 words. Mm -hmm. And um, the editor said, you know, you should, you write so much for every photograph that maybe you ought to uh, be a reporter. I said, no, 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 I don't want to be a reporter. It's just that I have to get this information there, you know, about the photographs that so would use, you know, pretty much, they would edit, you know, this, you know, maybe 50 words down to, you know, 25 or less. The first time I published an article was, uh, I think it was 19, it was, uh, I think it was like 20 years, a labor strike in uh, New York's Chinatown uh, that took place in 1974. So I think it was like 1994. The editor said, well, you know more about this than any reporter I have on staff. So why don't you write an article about this 20-year anniversary? Mm -hmm. So at that point, I was able to, I forced myself to write. So, uh, <laughs> well, and, look, uh, you know, the, and, and it was a successful article? Uh, I would, yeah, I think it was you know, a successful article. I, I tried to bring some history to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I brought in uh, uh, two people that uh, I sort of interviewed. One woman was running for city council at the time. And, you know, it, it took me a really long time. And I said to myself, if I was a reporter on deadline and I had to get it in by, what, what 6 o'clock or something like that for a daily newspaper, I'd never make it. Mm. Yeah, they, they used about the two photographs. It took me like a whole week to write the article. It was a good thing it was a weekly. <laughs> if it well, was a daily, you know, I'd be fired on the spot. Well, Corky, tell me about this this idea of the... Because I, I, I really met you through AAJ, the Asian American Journalists Association. And sometimes I like to hang out with the photographers because I appreciate their craft. I know a little about photography. I'm, I'm awed by their images. But how do, they, uh, how do you make that, that, uh, that melding between photography and journalism? I mean, you, you learned with your story and uh, about the labor strike. And, you know, you came from an activist position doing the before and after pictures. But how, how do you think the best photojournalists justify... I mean, they're, they're not word people, they're image people, but they're still journalists. Well, I think a lot of photographers, you know, photojournalists don't, don't like to be uh, 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 having a, uh, a print reporter hanging around with them, mm -hmm. okay? Because they, they, they generally see things in an entirely different uh, manner. Uh, the stars don't get any quotes, so they'll leave the quotes to the uh, print person. Okay, um, so and they they have their own way of seeing and, and uh, you know and writing through 
uh, photography about what takes place. And, and there are times that, you know, the images are much more um, powerful than, than the writing. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that the newspapers are using more photographs uh, than uh, the written stuff, because I think, in general, people resonate uh, initially with a, uh, a photograph. And then if they get interested, then they uh, read the story. Mm. Right. I, I, have to, I, I think that, that happens with me. I, I have to tell you that I had a new appreciation for photography and journalism when I worked at a small paper that required reporters to take the pictures as well. I mean, yeah. it was it was short stuff. Yeah. This was in, um, you know, I, I had made the shift from, I went from television to radio and then... I wanted to be a writer, so I, I worked for a small paper in Stockton. Uh, I worked for the record, uh -huh. and they made me take uh -huh. pictures, which I gladly did because I, I knew something about photography, but I really appreciated what the photographer's role was, and I also knew that when I had a good picture, when I had a good image, that it was you know, more powerful than the story. But there's, there yeah. is, there is something that happened in the digital age and that's yeah, video, if, that's video, right? If you can have the yeah. pictures talk or if you can accompany some, some newspapers use a slideshow, they show a picture and they have audio. Yeah. Did the digital world probably has, how has that changed how you do your work? Well, I, I think I'm pretty much still old school, uh, I don't think the the stuff that I that I produce always has some audio or or, or you know something written. Mm -hmm. uh, my last exhibit, uh, and it was sort of retrospective in 2016. It was a, a 45 year period of, of photographs of pretty much Chinese American stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so what I did uh, for caption information, I wrote maybe. Two sentences at most mm -hmm. about every photograph. Mm -hmm. So, and then I, uh, I would have a uh, something laminated, uh, a couple of uh, laminated uh, placards, uh, and I would number the photographs. And I would have a number next to the uh, the photo, uh, you know, the uh, uh, sort of a photo list. So when people came in, I would give them the uh, this laminated uh, sheet of paper. And they uh, would follow the photographs by the numbers, uh, and then look at the uh, sheet to see what corresponded. Mm. So and, uh, I may have given an introduction. Uh, I said, "Well, you know, look for the numbers, and the numbers correspond to this sheet." So, you know, uh, and then uh, I think I always had a, a laser pointer. So you know, I would show them where the numbers are because the numbers are really very small. Right. I couldn't get the pins that were had larger numbers on it because they don't make them that big at all. You know, there, there are newspapers that would have, like, a slideshow, and then they would have caption information underneath. Mm -hmm. So, but what I generally do, uh, I'm going to be doing an exhibit in, uh, I call it a pop-up exhibit in Seattle uh, during uh, Memorial Day. So I'm going to bring, like, 16 photographs uh, to 24. And I'm going to put them up on easels. And then as people come in, uh, to hear my talk, I'm going to give them a, a very small post-it note, and uh, they will have an opportunity to uh, vote, you know, on the photograph that they want me to talk about. It's mm -hmm. kind of like David Lenman's top ten reasons why, you know, uh, uh, Trump survived his first hundred days, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, based on the, the balloting, I will talk about the top ten photographs. Mm -hmm. Hey, speaking, all right, this is a good segue into your five favorite photographs that you've taken. Because we've outlined how your, your sense of it comes out of activism, an impulse to document, uh, a sense of history. What are the five photographs that stand out in your, I, I know five may, may, uh, May not do justice to all the your body of work, but it. I think five five is a good number to start with. Uh, I would say the, uh, the, the 
the most recent photograph would be uh, post-9-11, uh, mm-hmm. when uh, Sikhs were being uh, targeted uh, and racially profiled as being uh, terrorists and, and being part of the Taliban. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was four days after 9-11 in New York, and I heard about a uh, gathering of Sikhs in Central Park. So I decided to go there to see what I can find. And I found uh, one uh, Sikh uh, individual, uh, a fellow wearing a turban, red turban, and he has an American flag wrapped around him. But to to keep the American flag uh, draped over his shoulders, uh, he had uh, had another American flag that was on a a small uh, uh, dowel. Mm -hmm. So he tied a knot, and then he put the the dowel of the uh, small American flag through it so it wouldn't uh, come apart. And uh, he has his uh, hands clasped in front of him. And uh, I won a, a photojournalism award uh, the following year for that photograph hmm. uh, by New York State. And the reason uh, why that resonates is because of the historic fact, but also because the judge uh, uh, pinned a uh, comment on the uh, photograph, which I don't think judges normally do, because I, I wasn't there at the judging. Mm-hmm. But the comment was, that uh, there's a compelling, devious stare on the individual. Mm-hmm. I said, what? <laughs> what, what? What constitutes a, a devious stare? Yeah. All right. At, at some point before I'm six feet under, pushing up daisies, I'd like to meet the person who wrote that. Mm. But I know that the judge came from uh, Massachusetts. That's the only thing I knew. Mm. I, I have to go back and find the list of all the judges and, and query each one of them. To find out who wrote that, and then take his picture. Uh, uh, well, no, I'll not take his picture. Well, yeah, I probably would like to take his picture if he would allow me. Uh, and uh, but I really want to find out what what constitute a, a compelling devious stare. I mean, mm-hmm. compelling devious stare is well, those three words just kind of you know, rattled my cage. Yeah. All right. What what other uh, what other uh, the other four? Well, uh, it would have to do with uh, the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, in uh, 2014, on the 145th anniversary, I was uh, fortunate enough to, uh, through my organizing, uh, get 200-plus uh, people in front of those two locomotives on May 10th, 2014. Uh, I was hoping for, hopefully, maybe 145 people, because each person would represent one year, that the Chinese were not recognized from going back to that 1869 photograph. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, another photograph is of the uh, a natural limestone uh, rock formation in the form of an arch. And it's called, originally it was called the Chinaman's Arch. Mm-hmm. But probably about 10 years ago, local Japanese uh, uh, Americans and Chinese Americans in Salt Lake City got them to change the name to the Chinese Arch. Mm-hmm. So the Arch is about uh, four and a half miles away from where the two locomotives have their reenactment every year mm-hmm. for probably the last 65 years or so. Uh, and so the uh, limestone rock formation by itself is you know one photograph that a lot of people don't know about. So I, I, every time I show that, I have to explain why I have that photograph, because I generally have some photojournalistic uh, photograph involving people or something like that right. that people can uh, realize. So, you know, maybe I should uh, put that photograph next to Mount Rushmore with yeah. the four presidents, you know, yeah. and, and say that this is this is my version, this is the Chinese-American version of Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Uh, so another photograph I took last year involved the Chinese arch but with a Buddhist priest and some of the people who came to the reenactment. Mm-hmm. So the Buddhist priest is uh, conducting a memorial ceremony. Mm-hmm. And uh, after leaving, uh, a woman who's a railroad descendant, uh, she's probably about 76 years old, she said never in uh, the history that she knew of, because she's gone to some of the railroad enactments uh, previously, they've never had a Buddhist ceremony. Mm-hmm. So she thanked me uh, yeah. uh, for... for, for 
conducting that. And I said to him, wait a minute, I, I can't possibly be the first one or the only one to have done that. And, and she said as far as she, she knew, nobody ever did that. So uh, I, felt, uh, I felt honored. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to continue that. So that's four photographs, right? Right. What's the last uh, one? I talked about them. The last one would probably be uh, uh, my uh, first, probably my, yeah, yeah. It would be my first you know, front page photograph in the, the New York Post going back to 1975. Uh, um, it, the Chinese community numbering 20,000 people had marched from Chinatown to City Hall. I got this photograph of uh, a protester who was struck on the head, and he's being uh, led away uh, by two police officers. So uh, I actually beat out the Daily News photographer uh, in, in, uh, in capturing that photograph. And, and this is at a time when there's no, there no such thing as autofocus. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had to use a hyperfocus and a wide-angle lens to a certain f-stop. Everything from five feet to infinity would be in focus. Right. All right. So I set that before I ran down the sidelines and then kind of did a button hook like a, a wide receiver does in football. Hey, I know that. And, I and, played and football. I, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you, so uh, I outran the uh, daily news photographer because in the wide, uh, in the full frame photograph, you see someone with the two cameras, but you just, no, you just see the two cameras. Uh, you don't see the individual. But his photograph of the same event didn't uh, show up until the following morning. Because uh -huh. at the time, in 1975, the New York Post had uh, what's called a Wall Street edition. And it would uh, uh, publish the uh, opening uh, stops on, on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. So it showed up by about, uh, I think, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, uh, by 2 o'clock, I had gone back to uh, City Hall because there was still a protest going on. And uh, the New York Post had delivered a batch of newspapers to a, a newsstand that was, uh, it's still there, uh, uh, on the same block as City Hall. I, I noticed there was a big uh, a flurry of activity in the newsstand, and I didn't really pay too much attention until somebody bought a copy of the paper over to me and says, Corky, is this you? It, it says, photograph by Corky Lee. And that's when I saw the photograph uh, on the front page, and it took up, I think it was five columns out of six columns. Wow. And then on the inside, and then on the inside, page two, I think page two, and maybe page three had, uh, had two more photographs. Made me feel really good. Uh, yeah. I, I think I, I only got uh, a total amount of $105 for, because, no, there's three photographs. Yeah, so I got uh, $35 for each photograph. Wow. Even front page photograph, yeah, it was still $35. But um, uh, that took place in, uh, I think it was like uh, May, I think, or April. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was April of 1975. But that uh, same uh, summer, um, sometime in uh, July, August, the New York Post did a, um, a daily article, it, a uh, feature article uh, on Chinese in uh, America and Chinese in New York City. Mm. And I got the photographs every day for them. For like, uh, it was, uh, they didn't have a Sunday edition. They had uh, a six edition. So somewhere I still have that. But, you know, and I think that may have been the first time a daily newspaper in New York City did a feature article every day on Chinese in New York City. Mm. So that was, uh, that was your, those, those were your five. And of course, one of the things yeah. that I, I wanted to talk about specifically was, you know, the railroad picture, because you're you're going to have a big event coming up. Where are you going to reenact on May 10th again, or what, what's what's the situation? Yeah, yeah, I, I've been doing an annual pilgrimage uh, every May 10th since uh, since uh, 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, this year. Uh, I expect about 90 people, uh, aside from the local people from Salt Lake City, uh, in which there will be at least two, maybe three railroad descendants mm -hmm. uh, that are Chinese, but, but there, there may be uh, some Japanese Americans who are railroad descendants, you know, post uh, 1882. Uh, 
Uh, there are people, there's maybe about two dozen people coming from the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Mm-hmm. Uh, I understand two people are coming out by motorcycle. Oh, yeah. Uh, they're, yeah, they're going to, you know, motorcycle out from the Bay Area. <laughs> I don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, but the, the, that's why I understand. There are two people that are coming from uh, California, and the, the two people are also from the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California. Yeah. Uh, I think on the 130th, uh, maybe the 135th, you know, they've had, uh, you know, maybe uh, half a dozen people come. Uh, there's a couple, you know, you know James Yee, he's a photographer yeah. uh, that's in Indianapolis. Yeah. He and his wife are going to drive out from Indianapolis. Wow. And there's a, a woman and her husband, Anita Look, L-U-K, uh, she's connected to the Chinese American Museum of Chicago, so she's uh, uh, flying out or uh, coming by railroad. Oh, but some of the people from the San Francisco Bay Area are going to come out by railroad, too, oh. on Amtrak, because <laughs> the train goes through Donner's Pass, Truckee, and so forth. Yeah. So, so uh, tell me about the, the, the photograph, though. This was the, the, the photograph that people know that has been publicized, you're going to recreate this again, right? Yeah. I'm going to get there at 9 a.m., and everyone on the buses uh, will get in front of the two locomotives because you know, the park opens up at 9. And then they're going to, at 9.30, they're going to bring out the locomotives. But I think with 90 people, if I give each person of the 90 30 minutes for a bathroom break, it's going to take up 45 minutes. Oh. So... Uh, I allowed you know, a half hour, you know, uh, time for them to, to kind of get together. Because the, the ride from Salt Lake City is going to take about an hour and a half, maybe two hours. Mm-hmm. So rain or shine. And I've asked people to uh, wear period clothing, or at least Chinese clothing, for the photograph. Because the clothing, uh, everyone uh, else in the photograph is wearing period clothing. So leave your... Raider T-shirts or your New York uh, Jets T-shirts behind? Yeah, <laughs> behind, yeah. Where, so, where? Matter of fact, uh, this year, uh, well, one of the railroad descendants for next year has gotten uh, 12 Chinese costumes from a museum in China. Oh. And they're also going to um, you know, send her 12 straw hats that hopefully will be the same type of straw hats that was used in 1869. So I have to get her a photograph. And then uh, it, three days later, May 13th, I'm organizing an exhibit from Chinese Historical Society. They have a traveling exhibit called Chinese and the Iron Road. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be displayed. I'm also going to get a copy of Lonnie Ding's uh, 28-minute documentary called Canton Army in the High Sierras. I'm going to show that in the Ogden Union uh, Railroad uh, Station Museum. And I'm also going to have a, uh, this will be the second year I'm going to have a food demonstration. Hmm. Uh, last year, uh, Leland Wong did a food demonstration on what the Chinese railroad workers consumed, what kind of meals they had. What did they and, eat? And this year. What did they eat? Yeah, what, what did they eat? Yeah, how did they stay healthy? Okay, because, you know, the Irish basically had a meat and potatoes and, 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 and coffee and whiskey diet. All right, and they drank the water from the stream, so they wound up getting dysentery. The, the Chinese would always boil the water, make tea. But there's uh, dried uh, um, cuttlefish, abalone, uh, oysters, uh, pickled vegetables. You know, sausages mm-hmm. uh, that are made. You know, so someone from New York, along with Leland Wong, his name is Don B. Lee, who ran unsuccessfully for state assembly uh, this past year. So both of them are going to have a, a food talk and demonstration. So they're going to cook for maybe about 50 people. Wow. So you're going to eat and get a demonstration and and do this recreation. Talk yeah. about the photograph just for a second, because there are some... How many Chinese were in the initial photograph? You said probably not many, right? Well, uh, there were none. Yeah. The, the one... Uh, the one that uh, you see in all the history textbooks, there aren't any Chinese in it. So you're putting the Chinese back in? Well, I'm putting the Chinese back in because uh, a number of years ago I realized that 
um, when they had the reenactment, they would have uh, women in period clothing get into the reenactment photograph. And I said, wait a minute. You know, if they put white women in period clothing in the reenactment photograph, but they don't have any Chinese, and there's, you know, every evidence that the Chinese worked on the railroad, they don't have that. Then, you know, I said, enough is enough. I'm going to work on doing a flash mob type photograph, and I'm going to make sure the Chinese are in it at least every year until the 150th anniversary, which will be 2019. So, you know, I, I don't want the, the local people who, uh, local historic societies, say, well, the Chinese, you know, showed up on the 145th anniversary. We don't expect them to uh, uh, 150th. So, you know, I'm doing this so that uh, it's a constant reminder. And, and, and the work of an activist, too, mm-hmm. so that they don't uh, uh, leave out the Chinese. And uh, I think the Chinese will probably have the best-looking clothing uh, <laughs> when I get into the photograph. Yeah. Well, but, but I also I also know that uh, one of the railroad descendants uh, who got elected last year, she's a Democrat, and she got elected to uh, the Utah State Assembly. In her first week uh, after she was sworn in, she got both uh, aisles of uh, you know Republican and Democrats, along with the governor, to work on uh, recognition of the Chinese contribution for the 150th anniversary. Mm-hmm. So to that end, uh, since Elaine Chow is the Secretary of uh, Transportation uh, right. currently, right. Uh, they're working on getting her to come and, and speak at the reenactment. If it doesn't happen this year, fine. There's next year and, uh, and 2019. Uh, so, uh, but also, I think uh, this year for the first time, there will be a Chinese American representative sitting on the podium when they have the official reenactment. Okay, so it's it's like um, um, who, who's that uh, woman uh, from uh, Detroit? Uh, Grace Lee Boggs. Mm-hmm. She would wear this T-shirt that says "Revolution," but the R in "Revolution" is in brackets. Mm-hmm. And her theory was that in order to create a revolution, you have to take Evolutionary steps, right? Because if you you know, without the R, revolution says evolution. Yeah. So I'm creating sort of a revolution, but taking you know small steps. Well, Im- Im- important ones. And and at the start of this conversation, we talked about that photograph you saw in the history books. And how uh-huh. you had your magnifying glass and couldn't see any Chinese. So this is your way of, I guess this is the germ of why photography is in your in your life, right? Well, I, I call this photograph photographic justice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I can't go back in time, but I, I can uh, look forward to the 150th anniversary and... Uh, if I can get uh, Chinese included into that photograph, you know, I'm, you know, my, my job is done. You know, that's you know, kind of one of the things on my bucket list. Corky, I I really thank you for taking this time to talk to me and to being part of the podcast uh, to talk about photography. I, there's a lot of other things I want to talk about. And we'll have to bring it up at another uh, podcast. But I will say this. I mean... You've always been a very important person to me because back in the AAJA days when Connie Chung had shunned the organization for the longest time and then came back, it was at the L.A. convention, and I asked her a question and was booed or shouted down. But but I remember before I asked that question, I, I was sitting next to you, and I, you know, I knew you uh, from AAJA, but... I have to say that it was because of your activist urging that I had the courage to to get up and and ask my question of uh, Connie, huh. which was, you know, where where were you and why has it taken so long to come, you know, to AAJ, AAJ? Which she she answered, but uh, at one point they they just cut off my mic, which was 
I guess, characteristic of uh, at the time. Uh, AJA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so characteristic of AJA. <laughs> but but I, I owe it to you. Uh, I mean, I, I was thinking, you know, is this the time or place or should I do it? But, you know, I... Uh, I I have your urging. Sometimes you just need a little shove, right, to to get out there. Well, you know, well, when I, in 2002, when OCA got out to uh, the uh, Golden Spike, mm -hmm. uh, there were like about 400 people there, um, and they originally were going to have Phil Choi uh, speak uh, because he was snubbed uh, by the Secretary of Transportation on the 100th anniversary in 1969. And they were, we were running late, and uh, OCA, uh, whoever was in charge of that, uh, uh, said, well, we'll have Phil Troy speak when we sit down for dinner, which would probably be an hour later. So I just fired this chant, let him speak, let him speak, right? Mm -hmm. And the kids picked up on it, you know, because you know, I think some of the kids knew who Phil Troy was, and, and then uh, maybe... Uh, they knew that he was snubbed on the 100th anniversary, and here it was, like, 133rd uh, year that the railroad was uh, completed. Uh, they started chanting, and it, it forced the organizers to say, okay, uh, in, instead of having Phil Troy speak at the dinner, we're going to let him speak now. And, and the sun was starting to set, but, you know, he got to uh, um, speak. And uh, when I saw uh, Phil Troy last... Uh, it was pretty much 2014, after the 145th anniversary. Uh, and uh, I said to him, you know, the reason why I organized this flash mob with all these Chinese in, in front of it is because I know what happened to you on May 10th, uh, on the 100th anniversary. You were snubbed uh, because the Secretary of Transportation said that who else but Americans could have endured the hardships? Who else? Uh, but Americans could have uh, built this, you know, uh, where, well, who else but Americans, this and that and so forth. Mm -hmm. All right. So I said, you know, and I think that come uh, next Wednesday, May 10th, uh, uh, I'll probably have a, a moment of silence in memory of Phil Choi. Corky, I know that it's an emotional thing when you think about Phil, Phil Choi, but for people who don't know Phil Choi, Give me, uh, you know, a thumbnail to just to so people will well, remember him. Uh, so, uh, so Troy, along with uh, Hinmark Lai, were the the first Chinese Americans to uh, teach a, a course on Chinese American history in uh, San Francisco uh, State, mm -hmm. uh, and this would have been, I think, it was like 1969 or 1970. Right. Uh, he was also an historian and. Uh, uh, worked as a, an architect, and he had a book on the architecture of San Francisco's Chinatown. And he was also one of the founders of the Chinese Historical Society of America. So, uh, uh, you know, he's, uh, he should not be uh, forgotten. Yeah. Corky, thank you very much again. We won't forget Phil Choi, and we won't forget uh, the photographic reenactment on May 10th. And we hope that people who hear this might, you know, consider making a journey or at least following what happens. Is there a way that they can get in touch or get more information, like a website or? Uh, uh, on my Facebook uh, page, there's something called the 145th Transcontinental Railroad Journey. Uh, I posted something uh, about the May 10th, uh, but I didn't post anything about May 13th because I know a lot of people will probably leave Salt Lake City uh, the day after. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think, I don't know, locally in Salt Lake City, they'll probably establish a nonprofit organization to do more publicity, or maybe um, the uh, Utah State Assembly will uh, carry that on. Well, well but, send, uh, send yeah. me a link to your, uh, or the people can just go to Facebook, Corky Lee? Yeah, uh, you know, my Facebook uh, post, you know. And then, uh, and they can find out how to how to remember the May 10th event. All right, Corky. Yeah, yeah. 
I, yeah, uh, that'll work. I appreciate the time again, and uh, happy Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Yeah. Uh, uh, I should do something about the people who uh, helped start uh, the first one. Uh, going back to 1979, there's uh, some unsung uh, women in uh, Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. But that's for another podcast. Yeah. All right, we'll talk. We, we have so many other things to talk about. Is you know, not just the... Uh, state of uh, photojournalism, but also the documentary, also other things uh, involving you. But uh, good luck on the photograph. And if a Filipino showed up, you you know, you can maybe still have him in the photograph? Oh, yeah, sure. As a matter of fact, on the 145th, there, there were a bunch of uh, Filipinos. As a oh, matter of fact, uh, the fellow was wearing a barong, if I recall correctly. Oh, wow. Well, you know, Filipinos are good for, you know, they... They, you know, they might have gone to the real. Well, no, there were no Filipinos back then, in the eighteen. Uh, I don't think. No, well, that they, 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 they fought with Andrew Jackson in the uh, War of eighteen twelve in the Battle of New Orleans in eighteen fourteen. Well, there there might have been some who came up through Louisiana. True, true, and and they did call them. Chi- they were mistaken for Chinese. They called them Chinamen. Some of them, the Filipinos. Yeah. yeah. So it wouldn't yeah. it wouldn't surprise me if there was one guy and and maybe someone in Hollywood would make a western starring David Carradine or something the Filipino <laughs> <laughs> Well there, there, there are a lot of Chinese Filipinos. Right, right, true, true. That is true. There are being back back then or now cuz now they are. I mean they're Well, well, well no, there, there was a uh, there was a I think a sultan in uh, probably the 14th century or something like that mm-hmm. uh, went to China with his uh, royal family and in an entourage. And uh, after leaving uh, uh, China on his way back, he uh, got sick. And uh, uh, a year or two later, he died. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that's where he winds up getting Chinese Filipinos. Oh. Well, I know there are Chinese Filipinos. There, I, I was just wondering, maybe there were Chinese Filipinos here in America because of the anti-miscegenation laws, and they weren't allowed to intermarry, and there weren't any Filipino women, so maybe there were some. I'm sh- I'm sure there there are a handful that we have not duly photographed and written about, but uh, yeah, the I think the the uh, uh, galleon smash, galleon trade, and stuff like right, that. Right in the 16th century, right. So they were around in the 16th century. They were here in America. Yeah, but whether they are in the railroad. All right, so they had some in that last recreation, so that's good. And uh, yeah. and we look forward to seeing the final product, which you'll put up, too, I, I imagine, on, on Facebook, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it on Facebook. All right. Corky, uh, once again, happy Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month to you. All right. Thank you, Emil. All right. It's been a pleasure talking to you. All right, Kirky, take care. All right. Corky Lee, photographer, activist, talking about photographic justice. And I hope you can make it out to May 10th to Utah to see or be part of that reenactment of the Golden Spike photograph, where, you know, where the trains united America, but the photograph... The official historical photograph never had Chinese people in it. Corky puts the Chinese people back in and some Filipinos, as he says. So May 10th, you can go to his Facebook page at Corky Lee on Facebook. And that's our program. Hey, we're on iTunes. Please subscribe, rate and review. Tell your friends about the show. Share a link even. Look up Emil Amok. Hey, it's there. It's on iTunes, I swear. You can find us on Stitcher, YouTube, Podbean, anywhere where fine podcasts are served. It's Emil Amok's Takeout. And, of course, you can always click on it uh, through our Twitter, our Twitter account, Twitter at Emil Amok, at E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, or just go to the ALDEF blog at www.aldef, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. 
Oh, and one more thing. You can give us your feedback on www.amokamok.com. Leave a message on SpeakPipe. You don't even need a phone. You just click on it and say, and another thing. And of course, if we can translate it, we'll put it, we'll put it on the podcast. Why not? We'll make it participatory. I'll even ask you a question. Did, did the health care and it, or is the health care initiative by Trump going to solve anything? And are you happy with it? Are you looking forward to it? Will it bring down prices, bring down deductibles like Trump says? Or is it just fake news? Once again, we're home based on the website of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund blog. That's at aldef, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Check it out. And if you like what you see and hear, ALDEF is a 501c3. Go to the donate button. It's tax deductible. Once again, thanks for joining us and listening to Emil Lamuck's Takeout. Happy Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. It's May. That's right. I'm Emil Guillermo. <laughs>